In lesson 10, we have three different parts. The first part is on the equation of a line, and this should be a review for you. Part A of this lesson is called analytical geometry. That's the concept of an equation of a line that you can classify this lesson under the title of analytical geometry. And basically what analytical geometry is, is a meshing of geometry and algebra together. What we do in analytical geometry is make equations for geometric shapes, and more specifically, geometric curves. Now, a line, that's just a straight curve. Remember how we can define a line as a series of points all connected together? We can make equations for geometric curves with the aid of a coordinate system. A Cartesian coordinate system is what it's called sometimes. And basically it's just a vertical and a horizontal number line. And I won't put numbers on mine, but we can just assume that these tick marks that I'm making are just spaced one unit apart each. And just the typical thing that we do, they don't have to be named this. Usually the horizontal number line or axis is called the x-axis and the vertical one is called the y-axis. Now we've also learned that Euclid's first postulate is that it takes two points to determine a unique straight line. So we could plot the coordinates of two points. It doesn't matter what two we do. Let's put one there and let's put one here. So Let's write the names of those, or the coordinates of those points next to them, just to make it a little more clear. The one on the left would be at 1, 2. That means we went to the right 1 and up 2. And then the other one is at 3, 3. We have those two points there. We could draw a line through those two points and we could determine the equation for that line. Do you remember how to do that? The easiest way to do that is to just set up a little triangle based on those two points. You just kind of draw a horizontal line through one and if you're using a pencil just make kind of like a light pencil mark. Draw a horizontal line through one, draw a vertical line through the other one and you can see the little triangle that is formed there and the vertical side of that triangle let's just kind of clean that up a little bit to make it look a little bit more like a triangle and the left side over there we have a side that is equal to one unit of height and then the horizontal side of it is two units long our slope Basically, what that's telling us is the slope of that line. And do you recall the standard form of the equation of a line? It's y equals mx plus b, where m equals the slope. Remember what the slope is? The slope is the change of that line as it moves in the y direction relative to the change in the x direction. Some books call it the gradient instead of the slope, like a hill. The gradient of a hill or the slope of a hill. The vertical distance it changes relative to the horizontal distance that it changes. That triangle that I've written there where it says triangle Y over triangle X, that's the Greek letter delta. And that's a symbol that represents the word change in. So we see that word or that triangle that means change in Y over change in X. A super important concept to understand. That's the fundamentals of calculus, which is the next book after this one. So the slope is the change in the y direction relative to the change in the x, and then b, that's equal to the y intercept. I'll just write I-N-T-E-R-C for short, y intercept. Look at our line that we've drawn there. We see that its slope would be 1 over 2, right? So we could look at our equation of a line, the standard form, and we could say y equals 1 half x plus b. And 
if we want to figure out the equation of that line that we've drawn based on those two points that we've been given, we still need to figure out what B is. Now we could look at the line that we've drawn and we can see that it kind of goes in between 1 and 2. So we could say that the y-intercept is 1 and a half. But there's a more accurate way to do this than just making an observation. Mathematically what we can do is substitute either of those two points that lie on the line, substitute those into our y equals half x plus b equation and we can solve for b a little bit more accurately. And we can see if, if our, how, how well we drew our line too. So let's just substitute 3 comma 3 in. That would be an easy one to do. 3 equals 1 half times 3 or 3 halves plus b. If we subtract 3 halves from both sides, b does equal 3 halves or 1 and a half. And so our equation is y equals 1 half x plus 3 halves. That's the equation of that line that we've drawn there. And that's what analytical geometry is about, making equations of geometric curves. We're able to analyze that line in detail using this equation here. And like I said, this is the first of many lessons on analytical geometry. You'll be doing some linear analytical geometry and some nonlinear analytical geometry in this book. Probably about 30 lessons altogether, around a fourth of the book, deals with analytical geometry. And one thing that we'll be using the analytical geometry for, especially linear analytical geometry, is to help us predict different values of scientific data. Scientists and engineers use analytical geometry all the time to help them determine the results of different sets of data that they have collected. Now the person who is instrumental in wedding geometry and algebra together in making analytical geometry was Rene Descartes. I think that's how you say his last name. I'm not totally sure. He was a French man. I'm pretty sure it's not Descartes. I'm pretty sure it's Descartes. Think about the last part of his name there, Cartes, Cartesian coordinate system. That's where the Cartesian coordinate system, where its name came from, was from Rene Descartes. Just some interesting information about him. He firmly believed in the existence of God. He felt, or believed very strongly in that, not just felt, but believed very strongly in that. But he thought that the authority of knowledge rested in man, not in God small error there but anyway his view of the world was mechanistic instead of supernatural he just believed like these mathematical relationships governed how everything worked well I don't believe that personally I think that math is just merely a tool that God allows us to use to reveal his creative works to us now do you think God uses algebra and geometry do you think God is up there doing analytical geometry? I don't think so. He doesn't work with the same kind of logic that we do, I'm sure. He has logos. That's godly wisdom. And he doesn't need things that are man-made like analytical geometry, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. Descartes thought that the authority of knowledge rested in man, but the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Humans can learn a lot of things apart from God, but the real reason that they are learned at all or discovered at all is because of God's grace. So just keep in mind our ultimate purpose in learning all of these things is so that we can know Him better. Analytical geometry is one of the most useful mathematical concepts that you will ever learn. And there are so many ways that we can use it to study God's creation. And therefore know more about Him. So, for an equation of a line, one thing that you might want to put in your formula book is that standard form of the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b. And make sure you know what slope is. That's the change in the y direction over the change in the x direction. You can always figure that out by drawing the line on your graph 
setting up a little triangle like that red triangle that I've done there and you do the vertical change relative to the horizontal that's the change in y over the change in x or if you've been given two points like that there's another way to do it as well y2 or the second y value minus the first one over the second x value minus the first one and I mean it really doesn't matter which order you do them I and as long as you are consistent see what you can do with this you could for ours you could have said 3 minus 2 is 1 over 3 minus 1 is 2 so you still get one half for the slope so there's more than one way to determine the slope the y-intercept is almost always determined after you figured out the slope then you substitute one of those points in to the equation with the with the correct slope value in it already and you can figure out what the y-intercept is let's do another one get a little more practice in on this and these should be a review you did a lot of these in algebra 1 algebra 2 you did them in algebra half too but anyway given y equals 2x minus 3 find the line that's perpendicular to it that passes through 0 comma 1 well do you remember how you find a line perpendicular to another one remember there's a relationship with their slopes perpendicular lines their slopes are negative reciprocals of each other so if you've been given y equals 2x minus 3 that means that one slope is 2 the negative reciprocal of that would be 1 half is the reciprocal negative 1 half would be the negative reciprocal so our new equation and this is always how you should start every single time it tells you to find the equation of a line if that's the goal put the standard form down y equals mx plus b use that as your pattern to help you solve the problem and get you thinking about okay here's my formula that I start with there's always something foundational to every problem solving step this is our foundation here y equals mx plus b this is our rule that we need to use to find a new truth our deductive reasoning process we know what our slope has to be negative one half y equals negative one half x plus b so that's always what we do find the slope first then find b and we're done we've been given also that this line this new line is going to pass through the point zero comma one so we take that value and substitute it in to solve for the, the y-intercept so x is zero and y is one be careful when you substitute in just because y is on the left that's not the first coordinate in a set of points x is the first one so you have to say one because that's what y is equals minus one half times zero plus b that's probably one of the most common mistakes on these problems is that people just look at well y is on the left in the equation zero is on the left in the points in the way you write the coordinates so you just go ahead and put them in in order like that but that's not right in the coordinates y is the second value so we have one is equal to b basically because one half times zero is zero y equals minus half x plus one there's our equation we can always check our work just make a Cartesian coordinate system here just to make sure especially since we're just starting back into working with equations of a line make sure our answer makes sense well let's graph y equals 2x minus 3 our y-intercept is at negative 3 and our slope is 2 so that means we go up 2 to the right 1 we start at that negative 3 though let's do one more point up 2 to the right 1 draw a line through that and our other line is perpendicular to this or it should be anyway and it should pass through 0 comma 1 so we will put a y-intercept at 1 put a little dot there and the slope is minus one half x so that means we go down one to the right two down one and to the right two and let's go ahead and draw a line through that 
and those aren't exactly perfect but they are definitely you can tell that they are perpendicular we could put a little right angle box there and you can see that those are perpendicular lines it's important that we remember that perpendicular lines their slopes are negative reciprocals not just reciprocal of each other but negative reciprocals parallel lines their slopes are the same right it's a good thing to remember this would be some good things to write down in your formula book parallel lines their slopes are the same perpendicular lines their slopes are negative reciprocals of each other every equation of a line that you have to solve for or find you can always solve it this way you write down the standard form first find your slope then find your y-intercept and you're done every single one of them anytime you're asked to find the equation of a line that's always what you can do let's move on to part b of this lesson on rational denominators rational let's just start with that word and kind of review what that means a rational number what is that remember that's a number that can be written as a ratio of whole numbers or more specifically a ratio of integers for example four that can be written four over one we can express that as a ratio of integers we could even say minus four over minus one four is a rational number the square root of three that is not a rational number it's equal to around one point seven three two and the decimal places just continue on forever there's no way that we can write that as a ratio of integers rationalizing the denominator or rational denominators what we're talking about there is when we have a number like this one over the square root of two that's not the standard form the standard accepted form that we leave a result in we would want to rationalize the denominator and the way we do that is multiply above and below by the square root of two in this case to get rid of that radical sign in the denominator and that would give us square root of two over two that's how we would want to write that answer it's not wrong to say one over square root of two it's just not the standard form let's go ahead and do some practice with rationalizing the denominator on a problem and if you remember how to do this go ahead and pause the CD and see if you can rationalize the denominator or simplify that problem there and the homework sets you'll see a problem like this they'll ask you to simplify it remember what you do on these when you have a binomial basically in the denominator you multiply above and below by the conjugate and remember in any problem you can always simplify it by multiplying above and below by the same non-zero number you don't change the value that's there you just change the way it looks so if we multiply above and below by the conjugate remember what that is it would be one plus the square root of five over one plus the square root of five then we expand out that denominator remember how you do that you take the first term on the left the one multiply it by the two on the right and so you'd have one plus the square root of five then take the negative square root of five that's on the left multiply it by the other two terms and you'd have minus square root of five minus five and see the square roots cancel out that's why you multiply by the conjugate because it removes those radical signs and you end up with a negative four that's our new denominator is a negative four now the numerator let's go ahead and multiply that out and I'll go ahead and put that those binomials on the left put that binomial in parentheses that just helps me think about it a little bit more clearly kind of group it together like that and the two on the left multiply it by the two terms on the right and we would get two plus two times the square root of five and then the three times square root of five multiply it by those two terms on the right and we end up with three times the square root of five plus three times square root of five times square root of five or three times five 
would be 15. Okay, so that will simplify to 17 plus 5 times the square root of 5 over negative 4. Normally we don't leave a negative sign in the denominator, so we can just say minus 17 minus 5 times the square root of 5 over 4. Make that the simplification, or make that our solution. So that's what rationalizing the denominator is about. We don't have, or we do have a rational number now. We don't have a irrational number in the denominator anymore. And that's always what you can do to rationalize a denominator if it's a binomial down there, two terms basically added together. Remember in algebra, we always talk about algebraic addition. We don't consider subtraction. So we, were, we are thinking of 1 minus the square root of 5 in that original, or 1 plus a negative square root of 5 in the original denominator, not 1 minus the square root of 5. We always think of adding algebraically 1 plus a negative square root of 5. Think deductively about this problem. What was the rule that we applied here to this problem to figure out a new truth? It was the conjugate rule, right? Multiplying above and below by the conjugate of the denominator. That's a new rule there that we can think about, and we applied it here to simplify this problem and find a new truth about that problem. Part C of this lesson is on completing the square. Maybe remember doing this in Algebra 2 and Algebra 1. This is your second lesson on algebraic equations, working with those. We did some in Lesson 6 as well. Completing the square is basically a way to factor a trinomial, a, a three-term, a second-degree trinomial. Actually, it's got x squared as its biggest term. Factoring that into two binomials, and then you can solve for the values of x, solve that equation for those values of x that will make that trinomial equal to zero. Let's go ahead and do a practice problem on this. Now, if you've done any of my science CDs, you know about the scientific method. The scientific method is a step-by-step -step process to answer a question. You start with your question, hypothesis, then methods, results, discussion. You have those five parts to the scientific method. All that is is a step-by-step -step process to answer a question. Completing the square has some specific steps as well that you have to follow in order to answer your question. Our question here that we're trying to figure out is what values of x, what value or values of x will make that equation equal to zero? What values of x would make x squared minus 4x minus 13 equal to zero? Well, the way we do that is the completing the square method. And our first step is to get the x terms by themselves. And so we just add 13 to both sides, and we get x squared minus 4x equals 13. Then completing the square, think about squaring something. That's what you're going to do next. And you take half of the x coefficient. That means negative 4 divided by 2. You take half of that x coefficient, and you square that value. And so for us, that would be negative 2 times negative 2 is a positive 4. Add that result to both sides of the equation. Remember, if you add the same number to both sides of an equation, it doesn't change it. It just changes the way it looks. Now, on the right, we have 17. On the left, we have a trinomial that will be a squared binomial x minus 2 squared. And that minus 2 there, we can always tell it's going to be what that number is going to be. It's always going to be half of the x coefficient. x squared minus 4x plus 4 is the same thing as x minus 2 squared. You can expand that out if you want to to prove it to yourself that x minus 2 times x minus 2 does in fact equal x squared minus 4x plus 4. But this term right here, this minus 2, it's always going to be equal to half of that x coefficient, including the sign in front of it. Our next step is to solve for x. So we have to 
get rid of that squared term so we take the square root of both sides of this equation and we end up with x minus 2 on the left is equal to plus or minus the square root of 17. Remember anytime we take the square root we always have to make that plus or minus on the right. Add 2 to both sides and we get x equals 2 plus or minus the square root of 17. So we have two answers for x here. x equals plus the square root of 17 and x equals I'm sorry, 2 plus the square root of 17 and 2 minus the square root of 17. Just a quick review here of why we put plus or minus in front of the square root of 17 when we took the square root of both sides. Just think of this over here. Simple relationship. x squared equals 4. Well, 2 times 2 equals 4, right? So x could equal a positive 2. Minus 2 times minus 2 also equals a positive 4, right? So x could be minus 2 as well, or just write plus or minus 2. So taking the square root of both sides like that, we say, we simplify that to x equals plus or minus 2. Because both of those answers would work in the original relationship of x squared equals 4. There are certain rules in completing the square that you need to know in order to solve a quadratic equation, solve it for its roots. That's what we call those x values when we try to figure out what values make that equation equal to zero. That's what we call that kind of a trinomial when it's set equal to zero is a quadratic equation. It has this basic standard form a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero where the x's are variables, a, b, and c are coefficients. Coefficients are numbers that don't change. Let's apply what we have learned about completing the square to solve another quadratic equation. Solve it for its x values. What we want to do first is get this in the standard quadratic equation form. ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So we would say three x squared plus x plus 7 equals 0. And that just helps us remember what we're doing here. We're trying to find the x values that would make that equation equal to 0. So our first step is just to get the x terms by themselves. And then our next step is going to be to get that x, co x squared coefficient it has to be equal to 1. So we can't have that 3 right there. That's an important step in completing the square. The x squared coefficient always has to be a 1. So that means we need to divide every term by the same thing, which would be a 3 here. And that'll cancel that 3 in front of the x squared. So there's a new first step that's different from practice problem C because we already had a coefficient of 1 for x squared. We didn't have to do it in that one. x squared plus 1 third, I'll just call it 1 third x, is equal to minus 7 thirds. Now we can go on and complete the square. Half of the x coefficient would be 1 sixth. Square that would be 1 over 36 add that to both sides. Don't have a lot of room right there so I'll just kind of put it up here. So now on the left we can square that, we can turn that into a squared binomial by saying x plus 1 over 6 squared. x plus 1 6 squared is the same thing as x squared plus 1 third x plus 1 over 36. That's the whole thing in completing the square is getting that squared binomial on the left. Then we can solve for x. Now on the right we have some simplification to do. We have minus 7 thirds plus 1 over 36. We need to take that and multiply above and below. Take that 7 thirds multiply above and below by 12 to get 36 as a common denominator. 
that would give us a negative 84 over 36 plus 1 over 36 that would equal a negative 83 over 36. Now we can take the square root of both sides and we end up with x plus 1 6 is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 83 which would basically be the square root of 83 i right and then over the square root of 36 remember we can break any square root that's a fraction into its numerator part and its denominator square root of 36 is just 6 so we'll just say over 6 and then solve for x x equals negative 1 over 6 plus or minus the square root of 83i over 6. Now we can always check our work. Remember, anytime we have an equation and we solve for it, we can always check our work by substituting back into the original equation to see if it's correct. With a big number like that for the result, a complex number, we have our real part first, our imaginary part second. Remember, that's our standard form for a complex number. That's a pretty tedious task there is to, to substitute that x solution back into the original equation and see if the solution is right. I'm not going to show it here but I did check it to on a separate piece of paper and x indeed does equal minus 1 6 plus or minus the square root of 83 over 6 times i. So in completing the square in that method you have a set of rules that you have to apply the deductive reasoning process to find a new truth about. It's not just one rule but a set of rules in a certain order. First you get the equation in standard quadratic equation form. ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Then you make sure that the x squared coefficient is equal to one. It can't be anything else. Then you get the two x terms by themselves on the left side of the equal sign. Next you complete the square by taking half of the x coefficient, squaring it, adding it to both sides. On the left you'll end up with a squared binomial with the constant term in it equal to half the x coefficient and the sign in front of it. Make sure you include the sign in front of it. Take the square root of both sides to solve for x. Okay, well that's all for lesson 10.